Welcome to the Art of Faith podcast. I'm Pastor Joshua Kapczynski, Claremont, and, and I'm Michael. Pastor Joel Fairley, uh, First Baptist, the First Baptist Church of Claremont. And uh, welcome. I'm excited about what we get to talk about today, Josh. We are going to talk about brokenness. So, currently, I'm in a series, and I'm, I'm ripping off our podcast title. And okay. My sermon series is called The Art of Faith. So I've done a few, and um, I did not do. I did not want to do Mother's Day. I'm kind of tired of doing themed Sundays, and so I covered it. Did you cover it? I got it? you covered. Did you, did you mail it in? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't so mail it in. I have, but uh, I, I, it was. I'm going to bump all of my themed Sunday sermons, like Mother's Day, Father's Day, maybe even Memorial Day, uh-huh. to my to the other staff. Okay. Because I've already done them all. Okay. And I just figure, like, if I'm going to do another one, it's like I'm going to pull my notes out from the previous years. So anyway, I, I bounced I bounced um, Mother's Day to our youth pastor, Pastor Mandy, this week. Uh-huh. And she did an amazing job. That, that needs to be another one you should watch. She but knocked it out? She knocked it out of the park. She killed it. And the who, initial... Who was her... What was her scripture? I don't remember her scripture, but she did Thomas Kincaid. She talked about legacy. Oh, wow. Wow. And then I know that you and I probably have some very snooty ideas about Thomas Kincaid's. But the way that she did it, the way that she framed it out, like we we can't be critic we can't be art critics on that one. No. She was amazing. Because she talked about the whole the the whole concept of leaving leaving a legacy. And it and it's you know, it's a garden that you don't get to pick. Somebody else gets to pick it. Mm-hmm. And so she used her Kincaids that her grandmother has. And she had some good ones. She had a cute little chapel. And then she had one um, one Kincaid off. Or it was a Kincaid, but it's where he, he uh, put in Disney characters into it. So it worked. It was great. It was perfect. And everybody loved it. But yeah, I, I you probably couldn't touch a Kincaid, could you? Did I? You probably couldn't touch one. How do you feel about Thomas Kincaid? I, I, when I want to feel nostalgic and I want to, and I, I want to feel quiet and, and go to a little, pretend I'm in a little, little lighthouse yeah. with, with the surf, I'll go there, you know, and I can, I can go there. I, um, I'm never real excited about hype. And he hyped it, didn't he? They they really they really hyped it, and I think it once in one sense it was to his detriment. And then it, oh, event, it, it eventually mass marketed to the yeah. the Christian, and that's and that's that's one thing that I I I'm sort of one thing that we as Christians don't do well is we don't know how to take um, the foot off. Our foot off the gas pedal when it comes to something, yeah, like that. Um, I remember being in college when um, the guy who sang uh, "Raindrops Keep Falling on Your oh, Head." Oh yeah, I forget his name. Um, yeah, not Barry McGuire. No, but, no, no, yeah, no, no. But but um, but a very popular singer, and he became a Christian, came yeah. a believer, and basically. The Christians just ran him out of the church, not because of anything he said or did, but the expectations they had for him. He's Christian. Same thing with Bob Dylan. That, yeah, I was going to say that. We yeah. did that to Bob Dylan. Yeah. 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 So, well, anyway, I, I, you know, again, it would be hard for me to buy a Kincaid, but I can't appreciate him. We had one hanging in our house at one time. Did you? I don't know where it is Yeah. Now. Yeah, I don't think we have one, but I, you know, I I can appreciate what he did as an artist mm-hmm. and the aesthetic of it. Mm-hmm. They're they're nice, pretty pictures to look at, mm-hmm. and if it brings somebody joy, I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah. but the putting some dots on a printed piece. <laughs> like, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. For those of you who don't know, 
uh, Kincaid would print a bunch of lithographs and then he would just put paint on top of it. And then he would say and it's, then, a, it's yeah. an original. Yeah. Yeah. He'd crank them out. So he was doing a, he was a he was the contemporary Christian version of an Andy Warhol. Mm -hmm. Andy Warhol's Madonna just sold for a record price. I don't know if you saw the news on that. No. It's the highest uh, modern piece of artwork ever sold. I think it went for uh, 270 million. So the, Madonna, the Madonna, the yeah, Madonna yeah, yeah. Warhol. Yeah. And yeah. there's a number of them. You know, I don't know how you figure out that which is the first. Yeah. Because once again, Warhol was cranking them out and you know putting his name on. They're them. screen prints, right? Screen prints, yeah. Yeah. 270 million. The high. I, I think it's the highest. You know, piece mm -hmm. ever sold. And then we had a conversation about, you know... Everything. We... It's a... Um, it is... It is a fickle, fickle world. Art is a fickle business. Yeah. You, you, you never know. You never know. I bet... You... Nobody knew. He didn't know. Thomas Kincaid didn't oh, no. know he, had, he was going to be this big. No, he had no idea. He had no idea. Yeah. Nobody... Nobody knows. Yeah, you know, and and you're gonna make yourself crazy trying to figure it out. Right. All artists are trying to figure out the the magic formula. The that, magic formula. Uh, I'm always trying to work out the magic formula. I'm gonna, that one thing that's gonna <coughs> elevate me to the to, to the top of the pyramid, yeah. so to speak. And and you can't, you can't. Only thing you can do is be true to who you are. Period. That's all right. So I know we need to get into our topic, but can I get your advice on my yeah. next sermon? Yeah. Okay. So we could probably cut that out. <laughs> cut what out? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my next my next sermon coming up is uh, Art of Faith. And I forgot what title I gave it. Luke, what title did I give my sermon? You don't remember? Yeah, the one coming up on Sunday. Okay. Um, the scriptures as art is the idea. So my whole purpose is I want to I want to challenge people to change their perspective of the Bible. Yes, the Bible is a great rule book. It's a great guide. It's a great um, compass for life. You know, you can get some black and white answers. You can get wisdom. You can get insight. It's a great instruction it's book. It's a great instruction book. So those are all things that are 100% true about the Bible. But rarely do we view the Bible as a work of art. And so that's my whole purpose for this coming Sunday's message. And if you think about uh, Orthodox churches, uh, ancient churches, on how that they would revere the Bible itself and do these fancy uh, processionals, and they would kiss it, and their books would be laden with gems, and and so they would revere it as an as something special, something otherworldly. Now, um, I don't like the the concept or the trap of worshiping the Bible. And modern evangelical Christians have done this too, is that we actually worship the Bible more than we worship Jesus, or we put the Bible on a higher pedestal than we do the Holy Spirit. So that's what I don't want to do. But what I do want to do is, I mean, the book's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. The book is amazing. It's a work of art. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. It should not exist. It's, it, it's, it's, it's stupid. It's, it doesn't make it doesn't, it make, doesn't any make sense. sense. It doesn't make sense. But it does. But it, it but it does. It does exist and it's here. Yeah. So that's my goal. That's 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 my my intention is to to change the perspective of it just being a rule book into it's a work of art. Like it's cool. So, any any advice? Um my uh, my yeah, I think that um to look at art uh, to look at art, to appreciate art, mm -hmm. really depends on your proximity to it. Does mm -hmm. isn't that true? For sure. So yeah. that you, 
depending what your you depending what your proximity is, you're going to appreciate if you're if you're up close and personal, and you're tearing it apart and looking yeah. at this and looking at that, looking at that, it's it becomes tedious. I personally, I find freedom in scripture when I take a thirty thousand foot look yeah. at it, yeah. and I see I see that it is book um, bookend by two very beautiful pieces of imagery. Mm. The imagery of Genesis, yeah. of creation, yeah. and then the beautiful imagery and terrible imagery of Revelation. Yeah. But they're this all and they going work on. together. They work together. Yeah. And then, and smite right smack dab in the middle of all of this beautiful tableau. Is Come the gospel. On, Jesus. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Where these guys over here are all rushing to him. And then everybody else is rushing to tell his story, and so I, th I, that's that's my two cents. Thirty thousand yeah. foot. Yeah, I like that. A different perspective. It's a different perspective. Yeah. yeah, I think we need to have that. Okay, so that's gonna be my Sunday. Okay, so thank you. All right, so today we're supposed to be talking about brokenness, and so the art of brokenness. A couple of weeks ago, I did a, a art of faith sermon on. Um, on beauty and brokenness is what I entitled it, mm -hmm. and I used the, uh, the ancient Japanese artistic expression of a kintsugi. I um, love that. Isn't that great? So yeah. kintsugi, uh, for those of you who are listening, uh, we always want to encourage you to go to the YouTube page so that you can see the images because you got to see the images. But kintsugi came from uh, a 15th century story where a shogun. Uh, broke his teapot, his favorite teapot. Actually, uh, his uh, assistant broke it. And <laughs> so there's like, there is so much uh, gospel parallel in just this ancient Japanese story. It's, mm. it's ridiculous. But his, his um, assistant broke it. And like, this is, I mean, he's a, he's a Japanese shogun, mm -hmm. right? He's a bad... There's no mercy. There's no mercy. He's a bad dude. And the guy broke his favorite teapot. And, you know, heads are going to be lopped off soon. And so something happened that was, was out of the ordinary for that culture, which is a culture that is based on perfection, mm -hmm. right? So Japanese culture, perfection, utility... Um, precision mm -hmm. is everything for them. Mm -hmm. Intentionality. Yeah, intention in the, yeah, utilitarian purpose. Everything is, you know, the Japanese sword is it, the perfect weapon, right? It's, it, it's just, it's made to if, precise precision. If 12 layers um, are good, yeah. 24 <laughs> layers in a sword yeah. of steel are better. So this is the culture that we're talking about. Yeah. You know, probably very similar to uh, a Jewish religious mm -hmm. expression. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Jewish expression, the Torah law, mm -hmm. it's all about perfection. Speaking of the beauty of Scripture. Yeah. And it, revering it. And revering it and obeying it, it is all about the letter of the law. And so what takes place when this thing gets broken is like, first of all, he dis doesn't chop the guy's head off. Like, and it, and it's, it's, it's clearly communicated that he wanted to. He wanted to kill the guy for breaking his teapot, mm -hmm. but he doesn't. So for some reason, he showed this servant mercy and grace. Mm -hmm. Mercy and grace is expressed in this moment. And then the next thing he does, he ships the teapot... Uh, back to China, back to the factory to fix it, and they try to restore it. <laughs> but everybody knows it's broken. Uh -huh. You know, he knows. You know, he knows where it was cracked. You know, he could see the repairs, and it's just not good enough. 
Yeah. Like like deep down inside, he knows it's broken. Yeah. And so he re-breaks it, and then they, they bind it back together with gold, and they fill in the cracks with gold. And that's the picture that we see here of one image. And I love this one. Kent, uh, Kintsugi actually means to join with gold. Yeah. Or to bind. Yeah. To bind with gold, yeah. to join with... Uh, so, I lo- you know why I love this? Do you know wh- why you love this? I know why I love oh, well, it. Let me hear, I, mean, I already preached a sermon on it. Let me hear why you love it. Okay, here's the deal. Um, uh, first of all, it, you can tell that that's a beautiful piece yeah. uh, without the gold. For sure. It's perfect. You can tell that it's, yeah. it's perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw that imagery in preparing for this. I saw that image. And... Um, I was blown away by it because the bowl is broken. Yeah. The mending to me is is a cruciform. Mhm. The outstretched arms of Christ. Yeah, yeah. I that's why I like this one too. Yeah. Yeah. The and I am I am healed and I am cuz I've been broken. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, Pastor Joel walks with a limp, big time. And I, I was broken. And this, this is what Jesus did for me. Yeah. He, he bound me with Himself. Yeah. And healed me with Himself. And that part which has been broken and is now put back together, is like pure gold. Yeah. I, one of the things that I really appreciate you as a friend and as an individual, a brother in Christ, um, and a man with a testimony, is that it doesn't take too long before you tell me your story, right? <laughs> well, that's because it's hard to get off my sleeve. <laughs> right. But and I think that I, I love that. I mean, that's what makes you a great leader is that you tell your story and you tell your testimony and you're you're not you don't hide anything now being in ministry you and I both know when somebody is broken and when they're trying to get their life back together what do they try to do they try to hide hide everything right you can't you can't it would drive you crazy it, because here's the thing is you can't you can't put the vessel back together as if it never was broken yeah. because you were always going to see the cracks. Yeah. But what Jesus does is he takes the vessel that is broken and puts it together with something that becomes even more valuable yeah. to him. Yeah, and that's... And more beautiful. And more beautiful. And these kintsugi pots and vases and teacups or whatever... Like when they go through this process, they become more valuable. Absolutely, to the point where people are breaking nice stuff so that they can do this. Mm-hmm. And I don't recommend getting broken on purpose. No, I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. And uh, but I, again, I think you know the point for this is that it is so valuable, albeit painful. Mm-hmm. That we bring our stuff into the light instead of trying to restore it, we allow God to make it new. And make, you know what the enemy has caused for evil, God can make for good. Exactly. And and that I mean that's so hard, but it goes against our human nature. And because you know again we want to cover everything up, and we yeah. want to. Uh, in my in my sermon, I talk about a vase that I broke, an antique uh, nouveau vase that I broke, and it drove me crazy. And I had it restored. And so the vases are in my parents' house. And every time I see it, it drives me crazy. Because you know it's broke. Because I know it's broken, and I broke it. You no, know it's there. And you know you can't see the cracks from afar. Even when you get fairly close, the restoration was such a decent job that you can't yeah. see it. But I still know that it's broken. Yeah, and it drives me crazy. Exactly, and I, we know we are broken. We'll yeah. always be broke. We'll always know it'll never get away from us. Yeah, 
but the the fact is is that God is on his way already applying the new the new life within those cracks to bring us back together the mortar the mortar that puts brokenness back together is Jesus Christ yeah that's why I like this picture that's that why you I like picked cuz you got uh, the cruciform there right there man that would be you know that would be a great logo for a contemporary church. It certainly would. Then that'd be awesome. Wow, I didn't think you can about steal that. it. I'll, I'll probably steal yeah. it. I'll keep. I'll, we'll keep our Jedi Jesus. He's great, by the way. <laughs> He's great. I love him. I love him too. <laughs> um, yeah. So, all right. So, I, I think now I, everybody that's watching or listening most likely have been broken to a certain extent. Wouldn't you agree? I would say... And if not, the day is coming. coming. And I, th I, well, I think in one sense what it, what it is, is we, sometimes we would call it brokenness, but uh, that maybe it is, it is, uh, is God, well, to quote Ern Baxter, it is God tearing up the nest of our immaturity. Yeah. And, and it feels like brokenness. It feels like oddness to it. But God is upsetting that which we have established for ourselves as the foundation for our life. And, and I, think, I think it feels horrible. Yeah. You say but you to you, got to do it. But it has mm -hmm. to happen. Yeah. If God needs to bring us to the place of where he needs to bring us so we yeah. can be everything he wants us to be. And if we are going to live within our comfortable little structure of faith and ideologies yeah, and all of that, God's going to come on and kick it down and say, come with me. Yeah. I am building in you a new creation. Like, this is a tough thing. I, I, I mean, this needs to be preached. A, a few years ago, I preached a message and it was fiery. I was, I was like, I was going after it. I'm like, God wants to wreck you. <laughs> 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 he wants to get into your business. He wants to wreck you. He wants to wreck your life. And it he offend... wants you bankrupt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it offended people. And I guess I could understand, but the response was, I don't want God to wreck my life. I like my life. And I, I, I can understand that, but like, uh, are, are, we, are we too comfortable then? Well, and, that, and the, you know, that's, that's the whole thing. The whole, the whole thing is... Uh, if we look at ourselves, if we look at ourselves as as being an eagle, mm -hmm. is the best that we can be, flying on our flying with our two wings, being what God created us to be, yeah. flying with prayer and praise, worshiping Him, going and attacking the enemy from a strategic place yeah. from above instead of. And what we want to do oftentimes is shield ourselves from the effects of the world. Mm -hmm. And God says, I didn't make you to be passive. I right. made you to be aggressive. And I think that that's the, that's the key right there. I mean... I made you to stand before, yeah. the, stand before the forces in the name of Jesus. And, um, you know, he, what's he called us? I have made you both priests and kings. And kings, yeah. And I, I, one of the reasons why I went here in a sermon and why I'm fascinated with Kintsugi and, and even the, the idea of brokenness is that my, I had a college uh, professor, history professor, and he was actually a, an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. So I took archaeology with him, and uh, he, he, drug, he dragged me to Israel. Mm -hmm. So I did a semester with Harvard with him because he was a Harvard uh, mm -hmm. professor. So it was a huge deal. But I, one of the things I'll never forget is he's, he's teaching out of Jeremiah. And he says, so Jeremiah is talking about how God, God is going to break them. He's going to break Israel. He's going to break Judah. And he's going to scatter them. I mean, and so you're like, it's a hard, like, it's like God's going to wreck you, right? Is it was a God's going to wreck you type of a, um, a lecture. But... You know, from this, you know, extremely intelligent egghead guy, he was preaching. 
mm -hmm. in, in, in class. Mm -hmm. And he said, and he said, and I believe Jeremiah, when he preached this, that he used an illustration and that he got one of these big pots and he just smashed it. And he says, this is you. And so, you know, the world breaks us. The, the world breaks us. The, the world's world, gonna break us. It, listen, the world broke Jesus. Yeah. And we're exempt from breaking. Yeah, yeah. I have been and, crucified with Christ. It is not yeah. I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Yeah. So the world's gonna break us. And most people watching have been broken by the world. Yeah. Uh, the other side of the coin is that God... So look at that God, image and see what God can yeah, do with God you. God can put you back together. Look at that image. Yeah. But the other side of the coin is that God can break you too. Mm -hmm. And I don't know which comes first or which is better or which is worse, but you know, if we will allow God to break us, he'll break us so good. And... and the bottom line is, and don't worry about it. Yeah, well. Just don't, it, it's coming. God's, you know, as Ern Baxter yeah. says, <laughs> God's going to make you fly. Yeah. But he's not going to do it by coddling you. Right. Well, I mean, sometimes a doctor has to re-break your bone to right. set you right. Yeah. And I think if we can think about it that way, is a good physician that's going to, you know. His, oh, his. The, the bottom line is God is so good and so gracious yeah. and and always has our best interests at heart. Always. Yeah. You are more important to him. We are more important to him than we ever can imagine or realize. Yeah. Period. I forgot God doesn't love me anymore. Uh, I know. Yeah. It is... It, it sucks to get broken. It just it does. It just it sucks. does. It hurts but, either way, but, coming and going. No, it does. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But how do we respond to brokenness? We're going to see it right now. Can we yeah. respond to brokenness in in an angry way, or can we respond to broken brokenness in a way that causes people to stop and look and think and say, I don't want to be here anymore. Yeah. And I think this is our next... I think I think you got it, yeah. I think our next piece, yeah. this is their response. And our next... Tell us about this next piece. All right, what next piece do we got? Guernica. Oh, oh, my gosh. Okay, so... As believers, we all can agree that we live in a broken world. Mm -hmm. And one of the powerful um, purposes of art is that art can illustrate the world's brokenness. It can communicate emotions that we have a hard time putting words to or describing. And, mm -hmm. and so Picasso was obviously one of our best artists, mm -hmm. uh, at, at least commercially, he's one of our better artists. I mean, the man was producing a lot of great work. Um, a lot of it was pretty stuff. The Blue Series was great. Just, just fabulous. Fabulous and aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. uh, even his abstract and cubism stuff was amazing. And what he, you know, we did the, the soundscapes a few podcasts back. He did some of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Picasso, was a, he was a revolutionary yes. artist that experienced or experimented in a lot of different genres. No, some would say not the not, not the moral, not the best morally. Oh, he was a terrible man. man. <laughs> Let's just be honest. Some would like, say, yeah, somebody you don't want dating your daughter. No, no, no. no. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, but he did do this piece. Uh, this is the uh, the Spanish silver. Which one is? Well, no, it was. Um, I in reading about it, Guernica was a Basque village that the, was bombed in 1937. Was bombed by the Nazis and the Italian fascists. Uh, okay, that's right. And this, but in Spain, though, right? In Spain, yeah, in España. Okay, this is and this is this is in his yeah. interpretation of that. Okay, so this is, uh, for those of you that are listening, Guernica by Picasso is a terrifying painting. And it is, it is depicting 
the brokenness and specifically the horror, the brokenness of humanity and the horror of, of war. war. And there is abstract uh, cubist depictions of horses and bulls and eyeballs and tormented people. And, and, and people being decapitated. Yeah, and... it's horrible. And it, it, it communicates, again, the horror of war. And so it's not a pretty piece to look at, but Picasso pushes the limits of what we use art for. And and probably, probably primarily from Picasso, more than any other artist, is where we get into protest artwork uh -huh. and um, artwork as artwork used as a political means and or as a response as a to, response to, to injustice yeah. Yeah. and brokenness. Yeah. And so he's probably one of the first artists to really do it yeah. or do it well, where people are like, "Hey, you can't paint that," you know. In so, fact, there was all kind of controversies because they they asked him to paint on this giant, giant surface, yeah, this big surface, um, and he, um, which is like three meters by seven meters, hmm. and he, um, and so he designed it, and they they said you can't put that up there, yeah, but he did, <laughs> and um, yeah, it's. So this is the the thing is is that the, I think the, the reason why this the art of brokenness is that I think oftentimes at Christianity we don't know how to respond to the horrible things yeah. that are going on in the world and he, and you know we can't escape from it mm -hmm. I don't think this is glorifying it Oh, absolutely not. Oh, there are there are art. If you wanted artists to glorify war, they're yeah. they're all over the place. Yeah, it's called propaganda. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know this is this is not. No, and it's... um, and I and and so I really appreciate it, and I appreciate it that it that it is putting brokenness in our face. Yeah, and it's very fragmented. Fragment. It's you know we got shattered pieces all over the place, and he uses the cubist element to do it yeah um and then there's a couple of i mean this you know obviously it's depicting horror i mean there's death taking place and there's weapons being broken it's it's horrible um and then there's two light sources coming in there's mm -hmm. people that obviously they're it feels as if they're losing their spirit but you know you've got like this all-seeing eye, and you've got this and candle in, that's in the coming lantern. in, and they're yeah. they're front and center almost. They're front and center. They're shining light yeah. on what's taking place, and I that kind of gets back into our area of brokenness. Is that you know the Lord wants to shine light on even the ugliest parts mm -hmm. of what who mm -hmm. we are, what we've done. So what? So he could put he could put gold in yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we need to shine light on. Yeah. The stuff. So, yeah. Then, then there are lives. Can we go on? Yeah, yeah, let's go. Then there are lives that get broken um, because, you know, we live in a world where accidents happen mm -hmm. and our, our lives can be changed in an instant. And, and it seems like almost impossible in our own heart and mind that um, the gold that joins our brokenness back together is does it does it even exist and can it even happen well there was a 16 year old girl who took a dive in a lake and her life changed forever and she became a paraplegic and we know as Johnny Erickson yeah and um, I don't know if she drew or was an artist prior to the accident. Really? I don't know that, if she was. But most of her adult life, she's 72 years old now. Huh. Can you believe that? Have you met her? I have not. No. I, I, I would like to. I know we have fans in yeah. our church. She has a group called Johnny and Friends, and yeah. her ministry is, yeah, yeah. is her ministry is for um, disabled yeah. and reaching out to disabled. But um, she became she's she's a very <laughs> she's a very good artist, 
mm-hmm. in her own way. And as you see, that's what she does. She paints, paints with her mouth. She paints with her mouth. She doesn't. She has some movement in her hands, but not enough to. All she can do is basically manipulate her wheelchair around. Everything's done with her mouth. But so this is a, a person that chose to use her tragedy. And yeah. We see, we see a living example of God putting gold in the cracks yeah. and making something beautiful and good. And so she is, she is a very good artist. And so I think if we're, not, if we're going to talk about brokenness, the art of brokenness, we yeah. got to, you know. Well, I mean, she's, do you have any more pictures of the stuff that she's done? Of, it, yeah. Oh, let's, yeah. Let's take a this look. Is, she started out as a, uh, using graphite. Mm-hmm. And, oh, my God. And so she, this is, this is one of her, right? This is, this is a pencil in her mouth and doing that. Isn't that gorgeous? That is gorgeous. Yeah, and you and and I thought she was just relegated to a pencil, until then I when I was going through all her work, I just found these beautiful beautiful paintings and and so here's one um, could be on a Christmas card for sure. That is inc- that is stunning. That, that so one. it's a oh there my. you go. Look at that. Oh yeah, that yeah. looks like stuff that we would look at and. Be like this artist is amazing. This well, she is, is amazing. We, this we we look at that and say that's an amazing. It's all there: composition, yeah. color, balance, you know, focal points, everything that's important. And just in what, golly tamales, <laughs> just is with painted with her mouth. Yeah, and and at this point in time, we we don't care. Yeah. I mean, we don't. We you know, we would look at that. So that's a. Be- that's a beautiful painting in mm-hmm. and of itself. That's a beautiful drawing in and of itself. Yeah. The fact she did it with her mouth. Shoot. I mean, she's even got the constellations right. She does, doesn't she? Yeah. She's got yeah. Orion in there. Yeah. Dang. Oh, wow. That's so neat. And and then and then she's... Uh, this be, this is a beautiful landscape that I just loved, but it has some mm. stylized... It's Come stylized on. a little bit. Isn't that neat? That looks like a... It looks like... 1920. Bob Ross. Yeah. <laughs> No, oh, it's better than that. Oh yeah, it's way better. Than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this is like one of the parks. Uh, I know paintings. It's it's just it it could be you know, just it does have that that retro feel though, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Yeah, I just I I really okay. So the point with Joni Erickson is that she was. Broken, disabled, tragedy. I can't. I can't imagine. Oh, I can't imagine to live my life, not moving my legs, not moving my hands, right. dependent upon everything, on another person. And then she's able to create art that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That it's aesthetically pleasing. And none of it. And none of her art. All of her art is glory to God. Mm-hmm. None of it is poor me, poor me. Look right. at my condition. And it's not dark. It's not dark. And we have conversations about dark art. Mm-hmm. And we'll probably have more conversations yes. about dark art. And we have to ask ourselves. Um, but it's. Uh, but this is. Uh, I hope that anybody who sees and knows of her life will say there is hope for me there yeah. i can i am still valuable well, to the there's kingdom. hope and then there's a decision too yeah and that's a that's the truth of it there's a yeah. decision to be made yeah do you, do you choose to live in the the light yeah. or the dark even despite how bad things have been exactly you know and, and it's a little bit different than picasso so picasso was giving us a commentary uh-huh. with guernica yeah um But then there's people that are broken that produce dark art. I don't know if we yeah. want to talk they, about that. And they and they do. And yeah. they, and and then there's broken people who want to glorify God. Yeah. You know. Yeah. There yeah. you go. There you right go. Right there. All right. <laughs> what else? Do you have any more? And no, that's all that's of her. Good. Now there is. Um, See, I, when you when you presented the subject to me, yeah. I went, "Oh, I got." <laughs> I know you're. You got. <laughs> this is this is it. And then there are, then there are broken people, who become unbroken, and and 
you celebrate their life. And so this is a picture of a young woman. Mm -hmm. This woman here yeah. is uh, came across. She she um, came into the hands of this ministry um, called um, Sheer Love, S-H-E-E-R, um, where my friend Diana Batista, who is a hairstylist, she she's a trained hairstylist and um and she was in a salon she had clients she was working and god says i have something more for you so she has this ministry that's i think this is in thailand or philippines i'm not hmm. sure but she has this ministry where she is bringing um young women off the street and t and rescuing them and teaching them a skill that's cool and this is one of this is all she did was show this on Facebook or something. Um, and this woman, this girl, arrested me. Mm. And, and um, I hear her story. Her he story is she was, she was literally rescued from the street. And, um, and so I, in my own artistic way, I fell in love with her. And I fell in love with her hair. I was fascinated by her hair. And so I wanted to celebrate her. And so I did this painting. Oh, uh, yeah. I have not seen this one. Dang, Joel, that's good. Yeah, I don't own it <laughs> anymore. You sold it? Oh, yeah. Oh. Right away. I mean, I, did, I, can't, I couldn't hold on to it. Um, one, of my, one of my clients said, as soon as it, as soon as it was up, I'll, I'll take this. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and and what I, I the thing is, is what got me is her hair was so incongruous mm -hmm. to me. It was so big. It was so, and I was taken by. Um, there was no way that I was trying to create a realistic, yeah, painting of her. Right. I wanted to capture her her eye. Mm -hmm. and just the sheer enormity of her hair, and it's not much of an exaggeration. Mm -mm. No, not a fat photo. And so, Why some, did you go with yellow? Because um, I needed to, because what would, I, I, the thing I struggle with often is, is the tonality, um, and so I knew I needed to put her hair against something bright so it would highlight it and plus yellow is life and yellow is joy and and yellow is is and this is what happened to her she was brought out of darkness into the light yeah well that works that is so the contrast between this two are just <laughs> yeah i mean if you don't like yellow you're not gonna like this painting <laughs> if you have a problem yeah. with yellow oh, that's i great. don't well, because I don't have a problem with any color. Never met a color you didn't like? Never. Still trying to find it. What about poop brown? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going there. You, you, I'm sorry. You were asking. I know. Okay. So, um, so, yeah, this is all I have to present for today. But this oh, is so good. So we have a... Okay, so this is a broken woman, right? That's coming. This was this is a woman who came out of brokenness. Yeah, and um, and and I think in one sense, what I I I hope that this is what I the, I think this is what God did for me. Mm. God saw my brokenness, and and in my life out of brokenness, and I think anybody's broken life. Yeah. God wants God's desire is to bring to bring you out and and put you on display for the rest of the world to be an inspiration. Yeah. Cuz that young woman inspired me. Hmm. Just wow. All right, I'm going to ask you a hard personal question. Okay? As a pastor question. Okay? Because you and I have both have had, well, we've both been broken to a certain extent. And it's our job to help broken people, right? Right. That's hard, isn't it? 
Like, can't even tell you. Like, I don't know how to put people back together again. I know it's the Lord that does it. I, I, I don't know. I've been in. I have a, uh, uh, a, a dear one that I'm that I'm dealing with. Yeah, me too. And yeah. I don't. And finally, I have. It, you feel bad, and there is always that time, and I hate it, where you throw up your hands. Yeah. There's nothing I can do. Yeah, that sucks. It absolutely sucks because they're looking at you yeah. for hope. Yeah, and we and I and I think too many times that we make the mistake of thinking as pastor. Well, we can fix this if Jesus can fix it. I can fix it. Yeah. No, we can't. Yeah, no. It's. I do you ever feel inadequate? Oh please, I wake up inadequate. Yeah. <laughs> I I I I'm serious. I it's so dumb. my. My dreams, yeah. my dreams scream my inadequacies. Yeah. I dream about my inadequacies. I hate it. It, it sucks. It sucks. Because like, you can't, because, you know, our heart, like, we want we want to fix people. Because we, we're, we're called to love, I and mean, we do love people. But I want to, I want to lay my hands on, on, yeah. on people, and, and I want, I want the demons that people are facing right. to go away. I yeah. want... I want their I want financial stability right. for them. Yeah. I want I want the the um do, jar the doors yeah. of employment to open up for them. Right. So do you ever feel like if I was just a more spiritually mature pastor, these people would be okay? Shut do you quit, ever <laughs> quit reading my mail? Just stop. <laughs> I'm, not that's, reading, that's, I'm not reading your mail, I'm reading my mail. Well, but that's the same thing. If I you know I think if I were, if you know, if I if I read more scripture, if I had more script, uh, then these people would be better the script, off. They'd be, be better if off. If I prayed I be more, these better. Pe- they'd be I, better yeah, off. Yeah, if I was, if I prayed better, and if I if I really had the gift of healing, yeah. And um, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, I'd have all. If I had that, I you know, why, why, why can't I? Why can't I be the answer, the entire answer to the church? that the church needs. And the thing is, is we walk into that. We we walk into that. Yeah. That's what we do. I walked into Claremont thinking, I am I am the Messiah yeah, I'm God's for this answer. church. <laughs> Anything that has gone on before, I am going to fix it. I am the one. And it didn't take me long for that reality yeah. <laughs> to go away. And that expectation, but I tell you, I like what it. I like, I like where I am better, and I like. Mm. I've been eight. I've been a pastor for eight years at the First Baptist Church of Claremont, and I have to say, I thought I was going to end fix the church. They fixed me. That's awesome. That's they showed awesome. me a heart. I think they showed me the heart of Christ. That um, that I didn't know was there, hmm. and they are they are probably some of the sweetest people I've ever met. They're you know they 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 yeah. they are, they're human. Yeah, but they're they are precious. They're just real. Yeah. As real as real can be, yeah. and and I the the uh, in the seams of their brokenness, the gold of Christ shines absolutely through them so much. So one of the thoughts that I've had lately on this idea of brokenness, you know, God's gonna put you back together, right? And. Uh, are you familiar with that Coldplay song, I'm Gonna Fix You or Fix You? Yeah, you know that yeah, song? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great I, we song. actually covered that on a Sunday morning yeah. once. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that God doesn't want to fix us. He wants to make us new. Oh, uh, <laughs> absolutely. I mean... And, 
you know, so so um, Nicodemus goes to Jesus and says, yeah. um, you know, what's the secret? He says, well, you got to be fixed, dude. Yeah. No. He you said, be born again. You got to be born again. Yeah. You got to be born again. Yeah. I can't. I can't. You know, and and you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says yeah. it. Um, he comes and bids us to die. He um, and Graham Cook is. I like Graham Cook. Huh? I like Graham Cook. I love Graham Cook. And yeah. Graham Cook says, God is interested in your death. <laughs> <laughs> so you can become alive yeah. in him. And that's that's the bottom line. Yeah. I mean, it's Christianity is about is uh, we are obsessed with death. Yeah. <laughs> we are obsessed it because we're obsessed with life that comes out yeah. behind. Again, quoting Ern Baxter, behind every death is a resurrection. So I mean, a lot of our our congregants come to church and they they want they want to be fixed right they want yeah. and they want some hope and that's why they should come and um i don't know as, as leaders you and me like what is it what is the new thing that god wants to do in us uh, you know ever, did you ever think about that mm -hmm. like, what, what uh, um then one of my favorite uh verses in, is in isaiah 43 See, I am doing a a new thing. Yeah. Do you not see it? See it. Do you yeah. not perceive it? Yeah. And that's I, I'm doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. He's not. He's doing a new thing every day. Every day. That's awesome. That is the hope of who He is. You know, we wake up mad and grouchy and, yeah. and upset and guilty about our our stupid behavior and yeah, our stupid yeah. choices. And and God says, in my grace and in my love, I'm doing a new thing in you, my child. Mm -hmm. I, I love you so much. So, all right, one more question, and we'll wrap it up. All right. So, do you still have painter's block? I have. I have no. But my all my creative juices have now gone. I, to another okay. So I have there's some things like, I so have you're to finish. Writing. I have to finish a book. Got it. I created finally created a deadline for my book, and I'm I'm gonna finish that. And but I can't. I'm real excited. I got I got okay, blank so you, canvases all over all the right. place, and I'm like, ooh, I could, ooh, ooh. Okay, so you're connected to your muse right now. You just realized it's for the. I am connected to. Uh, yes, I am connected to my muse, and I know my muse's name, and my name, muse's name is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And God has a has a story that He needs told, and for some reason, in His wisdom, He asked me to tell it. Mm. <laughs> I can't Wonderful. wait to get it done. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, and He uh, has a story to tell. For you, he does, doesn't he? Absolutely, he has, he's got he's got a ton of stories, yeah, and he's looking for people to tell it, yeah, and he's looking for you, and and I, yeah, yeah, just be encouraged, everybody. God's got a great story for you, yeah, and it's I just let him break you, and let him bring it to you, yeah. Well, where is it? Wow. Well. The best advice I got was from my nephew is when he heard God's voice and I said, can I, can I steal God's voice? And he said, of course. And, and Brendan heard God say to him, let me bring this to you. Yeah. Let him bring it to you. Awesome. All right, on that note, let's wrap her up. Let's wrap her up. It was a great podcast. Probably one of my favorites. It was really fun. Yeah. I really love it. All right. Um, thanks for watching and listening. Uh, I guess you could subscribe, pound that subscribe button. Uh, we also need to finance this podcast. That our best of, I, Joel and I are going to get together and talk no matter what. So yeah. But if we could help, uh, if you could help get this podcast going and and help us financially, that would be great. One of the ways that you could do it is you could buy 
this sofa set that I don't like. <laughs> I'll give you a screaming deal. On it. I complain about it every single time. And I'm such a snob, aren't I? Yeah, you are. But it's a great one. It's yeah, uh, it's are. got good bones. It's not leather. It's vinyl. And I will give you such a good deal if you want to buy this thing and help support this podcast. In, and also another way, if you were to go on um, my Instagram, Art yeah. by T. Joel, and peruse through the uh, art that is there, if it doesn't have sold um, in the in the description of it, um, it's up for grabs. There you go. It's a great Instagram. I was looking at your Instagram today. I was showing a friend uh -huh. your work. Yeah. And they're like, oh, wow. Oh, wow. I got a lot of art. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's good stuff. Thanks again for listening and watching, and we'll see you next time. Blessings. <laughs>